Hey everyone and welcome back to another video from Amar Talks NRL Supercoach. Today in this video we're going to be going through the front row forward position guide looking at guns, mid ranges, and potential value cheapy options to consider in the preseason for the 2023 Supercoach season. And if you guys enjoyed the video, please do give it a thumbs up. Really appreciate a subscription to the channel as well if you do want to see more content during the preseason and throughout the entire NRL season as well. And let's get straight into it. So similar to what I did with the hookers, I'm going to be looking at how the front row forwards stacked up in terms of how they ranked in the top 20 averaging players over the last three seasons. It's a bit of a dismal kind of display from the front row forwards, if we're being honest. Um, Aze Papali'i has been the standout, although as it stands for the 2023 season, he's lost his front row forward dual status and he's only going to be available in the second row forward. So he's not an option for us at the moment. And before that, it was Tavita Pangai Jr. in 2020. But apart from that, there was no other kind of front row forward sitting in that uh, top 20 range in terms of averages, which is obviously a little bit of a shame, uh, but it is traditionally a position that doesn't have as much upside as some of these other, you know, fullbacks and halfbacks and things like that. The two notable mentions for the front row four, though, are Joe Tarpany and Tino Fasumala Awi. Um, they were 14th and 20th, respectively, in the total points category. Um, Joe Tarpany will obviously speak about him quite a bit in this video. He was an absolute beast in the second half of 2022 and may be the, potentially the best gun front row forward to go for for 2023. But because he had a slightly slower start, didn't quite feature in the top averaging. Uh, but he's, his performances didn't warrant him obviously getting into the top 20 in terms of total point scoring. So taking a look at the guns category of the front row forward, now I know in my team selection video or my first draft video, I mentioned that the front row forward was a position that I was probably not looking to spend too heavily, just given that, that lack of upside and maybe trying to go a little bit more mid-range. But if you are someone who does want to spend up in the front row forward position, these are probably some of the best names I think that you can consider. Starting off with Tino for Sumula Awi, um, 67 average for 2022, priced at $705,000. You know, you are paying top dollar. And the way that I look at Tino is I think he's just basically going to deliver what you pay for. I don't see too much extra upside or extra room for improvement in terms of his actual supercoach performances. His real life performances may continue to improve, but just from a supercoach point of view, average of 67, I don't really see him straying too far from there. And so I think if you are looking to go with, you know, just a top dollar front row forward to lock in for the season, you know, Tino could be an option. What I just don't like about him as much as say someone like a Joe Tarpany, for example, in the chart below me, I've got the base plus power PPM. I thought I wanted to use this statistic for the front row forwards because base plus power essentially shows the, the amount of tackles, uh, hit ups, but also offloads and tackle breaks that they make, which are probably the way that you can get that extra upside in the front row forward spot. Tino doesn't quite have that as much as someone like Tarpany, who, my God, as a non-owner, it was painful watching Tarpany when he was just offloading nonstop, falling, and you know people were just falling off trying to tackle him. Tino probably doesn't quite have that to his game, which is why I view Tarpany probably a little bit better for that slightly cheaper price. You know. So while Tino was very, very good in 2022, and I think I can expect maybe something similar in 2023, I just don't know if for the beginning of the season, you're probably going to get like the value, I guess, from that 705k price tag. Joe Tarpany, though, $699,500, uh, 14th highest scoring player overall. I think he was a top scoring front row forward, second highest averaging, and that was really only down to that slower start that he had uh, to the 2022 season. You know, for the first kind of eight weeks of last season, he was hovering around the 45 to 50 minute range. It was really around that state of origin period where he really stepped up and he started playing a little bit bigger minutes. You know, I'm looking at some of his minutes here. They really stepped up to like the high 50s. And that's when we saw the absolute beast in Supercoach Joe. Tarpany come out. He was had an absolute crazy run here. I'm just looking at it. Uh, from round 11, he had 63, 73, 78, 95, 82, 94, 74, 73, 113. And guess what? I didn't own him for a single one of those scores. So you can imagine how frustrating it was just seeing him week after week absolutely punch out these insanely high scores. Now, he is actually someone in the gun category front row forward who probably could actually offer some value. Um, shout out to Enrol Physio and his amazing Patreon. He does great injury profile analysis there, but he made some really, really good insights on his Patreon, which I am a patron and I really do recommend it. You know, Joe Tarpany, if you remember at the back end of last season, pick up that rib injury and that really does affect the middle forwards as per Enrol Physio and it can actually reduce on their super crash performance because I'm looking at some of his scores that he got after he had that rib injury. 26 was the score that he sustained in that game that he got injured but then reduced minutes of 56 45 and 44 which brought his scoring back down to 75 51 
and 59. You know, prior to that was when he had that insanely long streak of big scores. And if we're expecting Tarpany to be fully fit and firing coming into the 2023 season, there's no reason why he probably just couldn't go back to doing those mid-70 scores um, every other week. And so he actually is very expensive in front row forward but could actually offer you some value. Those numbers below me just show you the insane upside that he's got for a front row forward. So I think if you are looking to spend top dollar in front row forward, there is potentially some value still in Tarpany despite almost paying 700000 And so I posted a screenshot on Twitter of him. Um, he's currently in my draft because I read Enro Physio's analysis and I thought, I thought back to that pain I had from last year when I didn't own him. And I thought it's time to right or wrong. So I've got Tarpany in my team. He may not make it there come round one, but look, I think he actually could be a genuinely good option to go for. And I kind of somewhat take back my statement about maybe not trying to spend up too much in the front row forward. Someone like Taps could actually be worth it. Some of these other kind of gun front row forwards, I kind of view Offen Gawi, Payne Haas, and David Clemmer all kind of in the same bucket. You know, they're all around that kind of mid 600k price tag, and they're all coming around that low 60s average. Payne Haas obviously had a bit of a down 2022. He did pick up those AC injury issues in his shoulder, and there's also some off-field personal stuff going around Payne Haas at the moment. Now, obviously, that might not completely hinder his supercoach performances, but just knowing that he had those injuries coming into the back end of last season, um, and at 660k, I think it was a bit of a down year, obviously, for Payne Haas. You know, 0.99 base power PPM is, is still very, very good. Um, but for me personally, I think if I am looking to spend that much in front row forward, I'd probably just stretch up to Joe Tarpany, just knowing that he's got that additional upside that Payne House probably does lack. And Clemmer and Offengawi, I feel like I've kind of priced at what you're going to get. I don't see a lot of kind of additional value, I think, from either of those two players. Um, you know, Clemmer moving to the Tigers, Offengawi obviously staying at the Tigers, um, you know, all kind of now in that updated forward pack. Just don't see too much value in those two other players either. Where I do also see some value though in front row forward is Tohu Harris and Ruben Cotter. Now Tohu Harris we've seen as a former super coach gun, just one of those guys who's super, super solid, can get you like 60 to 65 every other week and, you know, doesn't make a sweat about it. You know, he's very, very consistent and that's what we like to see, especially in our front row forward. Obviously in 2022, he was coming back from that ACL injury and I think what we saw was a notable kind of step up in his workload and performances uh, during the back end of 2022. You know, the first four or five weeks of the season when he came back, he scored 37, 56, 50, 47, and 55. But thereafter, you did see a bit of a step up in his performances. You know, I'm seeing 92, 96, 60, 66, a 64, 73. You get the story. I think we were starting to see Tohu come back to his kind of pre-ACL injury levels. And I think, you know, if he's got a full fit preseason, comes into the year, you know, Tohu Harris, he's one of those really important players for the Warriors. And I know that they've got a lot of forwards in their squad but he kind of looks like one of those more integral players in their pack. So for me, you know, the average minutes for 69 last season is obviously quite high. And I think that's probably going to stay about that, if not increase. And so price at an average of about 61, I do see some value to him to get back to that kind of 67, 68 mark. So I don't also mind going with Toe Harris in your front row forward. He does have some handy dual status. So he is front row forward and second row forward, which again, I think does add to his appeal. So I don't mind going with Toe Harris either in your front row forward. This last player, Ruben Cotter, I have to give a shout out to Tim Williams on the Beers and Break Evens uh, podcast from SC Playbook. Uh, he did a really good job in explaining why he was starting with Ruben Cotter in his draft team. And, you know, looking at the numbers again, I, he wasn't really in my thinking, but looking at the numbers, I was like, yeah, there's really a really good reason, I think, to start with Ruben Cotter. You know, he's priced at an average of 59, but he kind of picked up an injury around round 12, and thereafter his scores kind of reduced to 34, 55, 71, you know, an average of about 50, when in the weeks leading up to that, he was averaging about closer to mid 60s, 70s, you know, he was getting 75, 68, 89, 60, 72. He scored the one try in that period, so really most of his numbers were coming from work rate, and, you know, I think if you watch Ruben Cotter, you can kind of see that in his game, and his base power PPM also does reflect that, you know, 1.01 is one of the highest here amongst these kind of gun uh, front of forwards so I think if you get Ruben Cotter kind of coming back to full fitness you know if he plays around the same a number of minutes you know let's say 57 to 60 you know that average of 59 if he's got a kind of an injury free season we may see him actually average closer towards the 65 maybe even pushing to 67 68 so you are getting about eight to nine points of value there on his price tag so Cotter is also a good option in front of forward again I have to give a shout out to Tim Williams because he wasn't in my original thinking but looking at those numbers and I think understanding that that injury did hamper him in the return uh, in 2022. Cotter also looks like a really good gun front row forward option to go for. 
So I think to kind of summarize my thoughts, if you are looking to spend up and are willing to go top dollar, Joe Tarpany for me stands out. If you are still looking to pay up a little bit more for someone solid but not quite stretch up to that kind of 700k mark, really like Tohu Harris, you know, he's got that added dual flexibility and I really like Ruben Cotter, kind of wouldn't really consider the guys in between in my opinion. Um, so I think those three really stand out in this gun category for front row forward. Now, just taking a look at the mid-range slash value options in front row forward, to be completely honest, I'm not really personally considering many of the guys in the kind of top half of this table. And the main reason for that is just I do think that their price tag, they're basically priced to what I think that they're going to deliver in terms of average points, which is kind of in the high to mid 50s. So I just don't think you're actually getting the true value from some of these picks. Like Josh Papali'i, we know is a really consistent super coach option. Um, average of 59, got a solid work rate, you know, which is reflected in his base power PPM. It's just the question of minutes you know he's getting older um obviously probably doesn't really mean that his performance is dropping off but there are a lot of you know good forwards in the raiders pack you know i'd rather pay up and just go for joe tarpany um fisher harris similar thing where um whilst you know the penrith forwards are really good they've got really good impact off the bench with spencer lenu and fisher harris he he just doesn't quite get the minutes that i'd like to see if i was paying up for a front row forward option and so I think that average of 54 is more or less what you're going to get from him. So I just don't really see that there's much value in spending that amount of money. I'd rather spend 560k, for example, um, maybe in my center wing and try to target a guy with potentially higher upside. For Newell Blake, was a bit of a disappointment in 2022. You know, I started with him thinking he would have a really good bounce back year, coming back from some injury issues in the years prior to that. But we just weren't quite seeing that. You know, he was averaging 54 minutes, which is decent, but... I was expecting his PPM to be higher than what it actually was, but it was only 0.93 on a base plus power perspective. So for Noel Blake, you know, it was a bit of a disappointment in 2022, and I'm not really looking to go back there at this stage. Um, Asafa Solomona, look, he always seems to get some interest in every season because, you know, you look at the guy, he goes on a streak probably of scoring, you know, two or three tries because he's basically unstoppable um, at the try line. At 550k, 52 average, you know, the average minutes of 46, he doesn't strike me as the kind of player whose average minutes are going to increase a lot because he's, to me, he just doesn't strike me as that type of body who's going to be playing bigger minutes. He looks more like that kind of impact prop, right? So for me, the 46 minutes, I expect to kind of stay about the same. You know, the Storm will have Christian Welch coming back um, into their forward pack this season too. So a Asafa Solomona, you know, I'd rather, to be honest, go for Christian Welch instead and take that 100k price tag saving. I know Welch obviously had a pretty injury impacted uh, 2022 with that Achilles, but he did delay his return to um, NRL just to make sure that he was fully fit for 2023, which is a good sign. I'd expect him to basically be fully fit. Um, in 2023. So Welch at four, with a 49 average, he has been someone who in the past has gone around kind of the mid to high 50s, um, if not pushing close to 60. I think I had him not last year, but the year before, and he was a pretty decent option for Supercoach. And so Welch, I'd rather just take the price saving and the potential value um, and cash generation over someone like Asafa Solomona. Looking at some of the Bulldogs props here, you've got Max King and you've got Luke Thompson. You know, Max King was a bit of a gem for us last season. He was a cheapie who eventually got deal status as well. You know, he got an average of 51 and that's what he's priced at. There is potentially maybe four to five points of value because by the time he actually started playing the more significant minutes of around the 50 to 55, he was getting closer to averaging around the actual 55 mark. For me, though, with, you know, the Bulldogs having new signings of Kikau, um, well, to be honest, Kikau won't really affect Max King's minutes, but Luke Thompson is probably going to have more of a role to play in 2023 than what he did in 2022. So Max King's minutes may also get impacted. And so for me, Max King at 540k, again, he's someone I'd rather just wait and watch on and not commit to at the beginning of the season. Luke Thompson is somewhat interesting at 512k. You know, he's been priced at an average of 48.7, but this is a guy who has previously averaged, I think, in the mid-60s in Supercoach. For me, the risk with him is the injuries and the concussions. He, he has had some kind of prolonged concussion symptoms. So for me, Thompson does present a bit of a re-injury risk. Um, and at 512k, I'm kind of happy to maybe just take a price saving and maybe instead take a punt on someone like Collins, Dan Safiti, Tom Gilbert, or maybe Christian Welch instead of someone like Luke Thompson, but definitely someone I think to monitor because that is a good price tag and he has been a good super coach option in the past. Campbell Gillard, again, doesn't really enthuse me. I know he's a great forward in actual NRL. It just doesn't seem to quite translate into super coach. You could say the same thing as well about Junior Paulo, his teammate. Um, you know, they're great forwards for the Eels, but that doesn't really seem to translate too much into actual NRL super coach. We'd rather go for the back rollers, I think, for the Eels. You know, Sean Lane, Ryan Madison, IPAP, when he was at the Eels, they just seem to be better super coach options from the Eels forwards. 
What is a bit more interesting for me personally, though, are the kind of bottom four players on the list here. I've already spoken about Christian Welch. I'd probably prefer the other three to Welch just because of that injury thing lingering over Christian Welch. I know he's probably going to be fully fit, but you could probably use that as a bit of a tiebreaker, I guess, to go with maybe one of Safidi, Collins, or Tom Gilbert at the Dolphins over Welch. Um, I quite like Safidi, 484k, you know, an average of 46. This is a guy who in seasons past has averaged 61. I know in that season where he averaged, I think, 61, he had this monster game where he scored two tries and scored like 128. If you took that big score out and looked at the rest of his season average, it was about the 57, 58. And so, you know, even if he goes back to that kind of 55 to 58 average, you are getting about 10 points of value there on his current price tag. So I do like Safidi. The Knights do have a good opening draw, so there is a chance that he crashes over for one or two tries and you know that could mean some extra cash generation at the beginning of the season so I do like Safidi um, and he's currently in my squad and very likely to be there I think come round one because at 484k you are getting a cheap entry into the front row forward position that doesn't quite have upside but he is someone who has shown in the past that ability to kind of crash over for a try and get those 90 100 plus point scores. Lindsay Collins, I was kind of hot on him last season, but he was injury affected similar to the season before that because I just view him as kind of stepping up in the Roosters forward pack. You know, um, Takiyaho has now left the Roosters. Um, Weira Hargraves is not getting any younger. And so for me, Collins is kind of that guy I see as a Roosters fan, just who I think should become the leader of the props forward pack. Um, and so those average minutes of 47, I would hope that kind of steps up to say the 50, early 50s, um, because he's got a decent PPM of 0.96 base plus power PPM. And so for me, hopefully, if he was to get to say the 50, the early 50s, minutes I could see that average of 43 potentially getting up towards the 50 to 52 and so you are still getting some value out of him which is why I kind of like the pairing of Safidi and Collins the only issue with Collins is obviously a lot of injury issues in the past um, but you know it's a low risk I guess in that you're only paying 455k um, so you could just start with him and look you know if there's an issue moving down the track you could always trade him out but I don't mind starting with Collins as well to begin your uh, 2023 season if you are looking for kind of a cheaper mid-range option in your front row forward. A few people are also looking at Tom Gilbert, who's priced at 494k. He does have pretty handy dual status, which does play in his favor a lot. He is coming in a little bit more expensive than the likes of Safiti and Collins, but um, he should be getting the 13 spot or some spot in the uh, Dolphins forward pack. So if he's starting, that's obviously a good sign. Some of his scores from last season probably aren't the best reflection because he was playing in the back row, but he may not play in the back row for the Dolphins. But just seeing some of these scores here where he played pretty significant minutes like the opening three rounds of last season he played 75 74 and 73 minutes for scores of 76 34 and 53 which is okay um, another game played 79 minutes for a score of uh, 57 another game of 70 minutes where he scored 86 which is obviously uh, pretty good but that didn't include a try um, another game of 75 minutes which was 47 um, and another game where he played um, 80 minutes and scored 65 so I think if he gets the minutes, he's probably going to be that guy who scores around the kind of early 50s, which is obviously still value, you know, looking at someone who's priced at uh, 47. And so I think it's kind of a minutes thing for me. You know, if he gets around that kind of 65 plus minutes for the Dolphins, I think with the dual status, he does become a very interesting prospect. Um, but if his minutes kind of stay as they were, and he's kind of, I kind of see him not going to above and beyond I guess what his current point scoring is that's kind of why at the moment I'm leaning a little bit more towards Safiti and Collins but I do think Gilbert probably is slightly better than Christian Welch just because he doesn't have any kind of injury uh, lagging issues around him I guess compared to say Christian Welch um, so for me when I look at these mid-range slash value options in front row forward I am targeting more the guys towards the bottom here you know Gilbert, Safiti, Welch and Collins are the guys I'm kind of looking at um, Luke Thompson I think is definitely someone I'm interested in but probably will be a wait and watch for me from round one and so that's hence the reason why I had Safidi and Collins in my starting front row forward in my preseason draft at the moment what I'm leaning towards with my front row forward structure is at least for my starting two maybe getting one of uh, Tarpany, Tohu Harris or Ruben Cotter and then pairing them up with one of Safidi or Collins that's kind of how I'm thinking about my front row forward at the moment but let me know in the comments below how you guys are looking at structuring your props um, coming into the preseason. Now, taking a look at some more mid-range value options and potential cheapies in the front row forward, I'm starting off with the Sharks pairing of Royce Hunt and Braden hamlin Ueli. Royce Hunt is definitely someone interesting me. 417k, so obviously a very cheap price. 
Price had an average of 39, but we saw a little bit of a taster at the back end of last season. When he plays bigger minutes, he can be someone who can deliver some bigger scores. Looking at his last three rounds of last season, when he played 45, 40, and 42 minutes, he scored 97, 45, and 55. That 97 did include a try, but if I take out the try and a line break, I'm taking out 30 points, still looking at 67. So you're looking at someone who's averaging over 50, priced at 39, and even in the round before that, he only played 33 minutes, but he did score 82. So again, if I take out 30 points for a line break and a try, we're looking at a score of 52. So in the last month of 2022, he was averaging well over 50, uh, if not 55, if my maths is correct. I believe that's about I think it's 57. I just did some quick math. Hopefully it's uh, correct. <laughs> but look, I guess what I'm saying is that with this potentially someone who, if his minutes step up from 29 to say 35 to 40, we may be looking at someone who's more real likely to get an average of closer to 50. And I think when you're paying, you know, 417K and getting 10 points of value, Roy Hunt definitely is interesting. I don't think I'm going to have the Kones to start with him, I think. I think he's going to be someone who I wait and watch on, but definitely does interest me because even his base and power PPM um, is also pretty healthy at 0.92 in comparison to some of these other kind of uh, value options in front row forward. Braden hamlin Ueli, his teammate, comes in a little bit cheaper, but for him, his average minutes were already higher at 34. And so for me, with an average of 36, I don't know how much of an extra value you're going to get from hamlin Ueli compared to someone like Roy Hunt. So for me, hamlin Ueli probably isn't too much of an option, and I would rather go take the punt on Royce Hunt. Yeah, obviously, that's a bit of a shot in the dark with Royce Hunt, but someone I think that's worth keeping an eye on. Maybe not a round one consideration, but look, there's always, uh, you know, we can always take the chance on any player, and if it comes off for us, then it obviously feels even better knowing that we've got a bit of a pod getting the points for us. Stefano Oitikamanu, it's safe to say that 2022 was a pretty disappointing season for him after what looked like such a promising 2021. You know, 2021, he had an average of 52 and it was a really, really good cash cow for us. But 2022 just didn't quite work out for us. You know, an average of 30 of the entire season, he was injury affected as well. And I guess for me, the risk is now that the Tigers have really bolstered their forward pack. I just wonder how many minutes are going to be on offer for Oitikamanu. You know, David Clem has now moved to the Tigers, so that's already a big middle forward who's going to play some decent minutes. And so whilst the 319k price tag is tempting for Oitikamanu, knowing what he has delivered in the past for Supercoach, I personally feel he's not going to be someone I'm look to, looking to consider for round one, especially knowing that the Tigers have recruited so many forwards. I'd rather just want to see how it plays out in trials, maybe in the early parts of the season, just to kind of get a better understanding of the minutes that some of these guys are playing before I commit in round one to someone like Stefano. Spencer Lenu, he's always a bit of a live wire. He was a good cash cow for us a couple of seasons ago. You know, I don't believe he'll be starting for the Panthers anytime soon. And so paying 308k for someone, you know, whose average minutes may step up a little bit. And so that 29 average that he's getting might increase a little bit to say 32, 33, um, because he does have pretty good kind of base power PPM. I'm just not sure if he's going to be someone that's worth considering as good value, especially in your front row forward position. I think you want to be trying to, you know, either go for the the best options, like maybe your your Harris, your Tarpanese, your Ruben Cotters, and then maybe going a little bit cheaper instead of going maybe with some of these in-between guys who are coming off the bench. And so for me, Lenu probably isn't going to be a consideration from round one. Sean Kepi and Jack Hetherington, though, I think are pretty interesting prospects for your front row forward benches. Um, Sean Kepi, it's been confirmed now that Marty Tapao has moved, I think, to the Broncos. So Sean Kepi looks to potentially be in line to take the starting spot that Tapao is going to be vacating at Manly. And so those average minutes of Kepi at 32 could step up to, say, maybe 40, let's say, potentially. With a base plus power PPM of 0.86, you know, an extra eight minutes may mean an extra five to six points. So there could be a little bit of value there. He does have some risk where I think he's had prolonged or repeated concussions in, in the past. So there's obviously a bit of a re-injury issue where, you know, if he gets another concussion, that probably means it's going to have a bit of a longer impact on him, say, than other players. But it's a bit of an unknown risk, obviously. And so I think for me, when you're paying 275k for a potentially starting uh, prop and he can sit on your bench and hopefully make some cash, don't mind starting with Sean Kepi. Now, Jack Hetherington at 266k had a very injury affected 2022, only played the three games where he was playing on the edge. So his minutes are not very comparable, I think, when you're looking at him as a front row forward or in comparison to these other front row forwards, because you can see his base power PPM is obviously much lower than some of these other guys here. Looking back at 2021, when he was playing a few more minutes in the middle, you know, he was getting some scores at the Bulldogs of 35, 33, 37, 
55 and 31 as well as some other scores at 59, 43, 40, 41 uh, when he was playing as the starting prop for the Bulldogs. So the way that I look at him is, um, that was, and that's, sorry, just to give some context, I was also on an average of 53 minutes. So I think if his minutes are around that 50 mark when he's playing in the front row forward position in the middle, um, you know, his average is probably more likely to step up from 31 to about maybe the mid to high 30s, so maybe 40. And so you are getting potentially nine points of value. And so if you're really in a bind with your budget, let's say, you just need the extra 10,000. You know, if you had Sean Kepi, but you went down to Hetherington, I don't think it's a bad compromise because you are getting someone who is also dual status. So Hetherington, I don't mind. Um, I probably prefer Kepi just because it looks like Kepi's more in line for a starting role compared to Hetherington. But obviously that could completely change in the preseason and the trials will hopefully tell us that as well. So yeah, don't mind Hetherington, but still probably for me is one that's a wait and watch. And for now, I'd probably just rather have Kepi in there as a bit of a placeholder. So Tom Ale from the Warriors, um, I've just got him here as a bit of a cheapie at $255,000, uh, $256,000 I should say, with an average of 31 when he's only playing 23 minutes in 2022, so a very healthy 1.35 base power PPM. Um, look, for me, I just put him here because I know he was a bit of a cheapie, I think, or he was someone that we used as a bit of enough with dual status, I think, two seasons ago, and he's obviously played some minutes in 2022. And so for me, it's one, again, wait and watch. I want to see in the preseason, I want to see in the trials how his minutes are used, because if we see a step up to, from 23, let's say to 26, 27, you know, maybe there's five points of value there. And so maybe, again, could be someone that we just look to stick on our benches um, if we are looking to maybe get some cash generation in our front row forward. But I will say, and I will preface that, this is obviously very early stage, and, and so I'm not too confident in what his minutes are going to look like in 2023 i may need to give a ring to my friend anton poster on twitter a massive warriors fan and he may be able to give me the inside scoop on that one the two other guys here davy moali and franklin pele probably you're going to see as the stock standard cheapies i think in most people's front row forward benches moali probably should be getting a, a spot in the 17 for the rabbitos and so i think when you're paying 235k for a guy who's probably going to maybe have, let's say an extra four or five minutes a game maybe his average steps up to another 26 27 he may be a bit of a slow burn cash cow but you'll take that i think um, when you're looking at a position that doesn't really have that much upside and franklin pelle it really comes down to whether he'll make the 17 for the bulldogs so again i'll wait and watch in the preseason and the trials let's see if he cracks a spot in the 17 because if we're looking like we're getting someone in the 17 at 216k probably will be a very popular front row forward cheapy as well uh, for 2023 well, that's it, guys. That is my breakdown of the front row forward position coming into the 2023 NRL Supercoach season. Hopefully, you all enjoyed that video. And if you did, please do drop it a like. Uh, comment on the video as well with any of your thoughts on the front row forwards that I've presented and maybe who you're looking to run with in your round one teams. If you are interested in seeing more Supercoach content in the preseason, definitely do subscribe to the channel as well. See you all in the next video.